Friends, he is risen. He is risen indeed. You got some echo here? Ooh. He is risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Grace and peace to you in the name of the one who is risen indeed, our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Welcome to all of you to this celebration of Easter worship at Ampel Presbyterian Church. It is great to see so many familiar faces gathered out here on the lawn to feel the spirit of those of you who are worshiping with us online from afar. It's especially, um, it's especially wonderful to have Joanne back with us in our midst. Um, she has been, in many ways, a, one of the many strong heartbeats of this congregation. Um, and it's good to feel your heart beating with ours this day and to look into your eyes as we feel it. It is indeed a day of celebration for the one we thought gone has returned. And along with it has come our forgiveness and new life. On the front of, of our bulletins, it says, he must rise from the dead. That's what I want to investigate today. The power of that must. Why it is so necessary that Jesus was raised from the dead. And what is necessary for us in response. Um, not many announcements this morning, just a reminder that uh, next Sunday on April 11th, the Presbyterian women will meet following worship. Please bring your own lunch. Session meeting will be the following week on the 18th. Um, in addition to the bulletins, as you came in, you might have grabbed one of the pamphlets. Um, just letting you know the the gifts of lilies and who they were made in memory and in honor of. Indeed, there are many who gather with us to worship, to celebrate uh, the promise of resurrection. Many who have been a part of our cloud of witnesses as this particular family of Christ for years. And we celebrate alongside them in the truth that the resurrection promise is also ours. So, with a mind to the promise of resurrection fulfilled in Jesus Christ, with a mind to those whom we love and for whom we pray, let us with gratitude and joy prepare our hearts and our minds to worship God. Oh, no, I'm Let us open with these words from the 20th chapter of John's Gospel. It says, early in the morning, early in the morning on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Now she ran to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said, They've taken the Lord from the tomb, and we don't know where they've put him. Now, Peter and the other disciple left to go to the tomb. They were running together, but the other disciple ran faster than Peter and was the first to arrive at the tomb. Bending down to take a look, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he didn't go in. Following him, Simon Peter entered the tomb and saw the linen cloths lying there. Now he also saw the face cloth that had been on Jesus' head. It wasn't with the other clothes, but was folded up in its own place. And then the other disciple, 
the one who arrived at the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. They didn't yet understand the scripture that Jesus must rise from the dead. And then the disciples returned to the place where they were staying. So begins the good news for us this morning. Let us continue in worship. And now I invite us all to rise, whether in body or simply in spirit, as we call ourselves to worship this morning. Let me turn off the volume on my computer. The stone is rolled aside, yet some doubts still linger. The body is gone. Yet some fear remains. The tomb is empty, yet may our worship fill us. The anticipation of good news hovers in the air. The fruit of the gospel is ripe to be picked. Guide our worship, O Holy Spirit. Help us to understand and rejoice. Our opening hymn, number 288. Christ the Lord is risen today. Friends, sing with me joyfully.
Hallelujah. Indeed, please be seated. I love that song, just staring death in the face and taunting it. Our call to confession continues from the Gospel of John, picking up where we left off with verse 11, reading through the 15th verse. So the other two disciples have, have gone back to their place, but Mary remained, and she stood outside near the tomb, weeping. And as she cried, she bent down to look into the tomb. She saw two angels dressed in white, seated where the body of Jesus had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. The angels asked her, woman, why are you crying? She replied, they've taken away my Lord, and I don't know where they've put him. Now, as soon as she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she didn't know it was Jesus. Now, thinking that he was the gardener, well, Jesus said to her, woman, why are you crying? Who are you looking for? Thinking that he was the gardener, she replied, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. There are still, as we proclaimed in our call to worship, many doubts that linger about the possibility of a true resurrection taking place, about, about the call to be the church that Jesus has left us with, about the new life that we who believe in his name are given. The life of faith takes heaps of trust. And it's not always easy. But Easter, I think, very intentionally inundates us with all the proof we could possibly need to believe that God loves us and in that love to find the power to trust and to be transformed by the forgiveness that we are extended through the cross. So confident in the grace of of God displayed through Jesus Christ, I invite us now to confess our sins before God and together let us pray. When our faith stands at the grave, grieving for a stone that's rolled away, forgive us. When our faith is short of understanding, though the truth is there to see, forgive us. When our faith, beset by doubt, sees no further than an empty tomb today, forgive us. Bring to mind the cry of Mary, I have seen the Lord, and grant us faith to believe. Then Jesus spoke to her, Mary. And she turned to him and said in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Friends, the one who knows and calls our name stands among us. Jesus is here. Jesus is alive. And we are alive in him. Thanks be to God.
Let us pray. We stand before your word this morning, God, familiar words of good news which we have heard proclaimed to us time and again. Or at least we've listened to them proclaimed time and again. Hearing comes from your spirit. So send it now to be among us, to prepare in us, in our hearts, in our minds, a place to receive your word and be transformed by it. And we might not simply listen, but hear your word to the church this day. And this we ask in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So following this tombside encounter, we can presume that Mary attempted to embrace Jesus. Maybe he hadn't been vaccinated yet, I don't know. But Jesus said to her, don't hold on to me, for I haven't yet gone up to my father. Oh, that's what it was. Okay. Go to my brothers and sisters and tell them I'm going up to my father and your father to my God and your God. So Mary Magdalene left and she announced to the disciples, I've seen the Lord. And then she told them what he said to her. It was still the first day of the week and that evening, while the disciples were behind closed doors, for they were afraid of the Jewish authorities, Jesus came and stood among them and he said, peace be with you. Now, after he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. When the disciples saw the Lord, they were filled with joy. And Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father sent me, so I am sending you. And then he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, they are forgiven. If you don't forgive them, they aren't forgiven. Now, Thomas, the one called Didymus, which means the twin, one of the twelve wasn't with the disciples when Jesus first came. Now, the other disciples told him, we've seen the Lord. But he replied, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger in the wounds left by the nails and my hand into his side, I won't believe. Now, after eight days... His disciples were again in a house, and Thomas was with them. Now, even though the doors were locked, Jesus entered and stood among them. He said, peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, hey, put your finger here. Look, look at my hands. Put your hand on my side. No more disbelief. Believe. And Thomas responded to Jesus, my Lord and my God. Jesus replied, do you believe because you've seen me? Happy are those who don't see and yet believe. Then Jesus did many other miraculous signs in his disciples' presence, signs that aren't recorded in this scroll, but these things are written so that you will believe that Jesus is the Christ, God's Son, and that believing you will have life in his name. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Can you hear me okay now? All right, all right. Peace be with you. So following his resurrection, Jesus speaks this phrase to his disciples three times. <clears throat> Twice upon greeting his disciples in the room where they hid out of fear. And then the third time spoken to Thomas, who wasn't with the rest of them for the first appearance. It 
wouldn't be such an interesting thing to point out if it weren't the only time in John's gospel that Jesus greets his disciples this way. Now, there's a few ways to explain this, right? First is to note the importance of wishing peace upon those who have just witnessed the southern aberration of one presumed to be dead. Whoa, whoa, peace. Hey, calm down. Now, another explanation of the use of this greeting is simply that, that it is a greeting. This is the first time that Jesus has had to greet his disciples since they began following him nearly three years ago. They have been with him and he with them, listening and learning and living together as Jesus traveled the countryside to teach. One really only greets friends from whom one has been separated for a time. Now, one last observation is that having Jesus speak this phrase three times within a short span of text could be a literary technique employed by the gospel writer. Now, John includes no birth narrative. He simply goes from a brief prologue about the word becoming flesh to Jesus's baptism. And then we're live on the scene of Jesus's public ministry, beginning with his disciples following him and the first miracle performed at a wedding at Cana. Jesus only writes, or John only writes about the public ministry of Jesus, which lasted three years. And then the end of this public ministry is marked by Jesus's public execution. His death lasts three days. And then comes his miraculous resurrection. Right? This isn't the only time in scripture we see the number three being used. It's used throughout scripture to signify completeness and finality. As in the completeness of Jesus' ministry at the end of those three years. Now the dictionary of biblical imagery also describes the number three as a rhetorical signal indicating special significance to the thing being repeated. So it's to this point that I would like to now turn our focus. The special significance of peace to the community of disciples carrying on the legacy of Christ. Stanley Hauerwas, a Christian ethicist, wrote a book on Christian ethics entitled The Peaceable Kingdom, in which he also emphasizes the importance of peace to the ministry of Jesus and for the world's status as a part of God's kingdom. He writes that Jesus proclaims the kingdom is present insofar as his life reveals the effective power of God to create a transformed people capable of living peacefully in a violent world. Jesus speaks peace to his disciples who are hiding out. And they're hiding out because they're afraid of meeting the same violent demise as he. Now among them, is Peter, who was rebuked for drawing his sword to defend Jesus with violence, who despite his vigor to protect his Lord, would later deny him three times. And who despite his inclination to violence and his denial of Jesus, became the rock upon which Jesus built his church. Peace. Peace. Peace, Jesus reminds him. The power of the church must not be established by the same means of power as the empires of this world. It must be a community of peace. Peter becomes a model of the means by which those who are prone to violence and denial are capable of being transformed into the church. The power of forgiveness. Jesus' peace 
is made possible by the power of forgiveness, which is made possible by the so seeming weakness of death on the cross. Jesus' death and resurrection make peace possible for us. Therefore, he doesn't simply speak peace to his disciples, but he reminds us that we are forgiven of our sins and that we are able to forgive others. We need not live in guilt or shame or restrict others to those burdens. We no longer need to feel threatened by the potential of judgment from others because we have been forgiven by God. Just so we must be sure that others do not feel threatened by the potential of judgment from us. And in the freedom that comes from all of this is great peace, claims Jesus. But can we really buy into what Jesus is telling us here? Our entire system of law and order is held together by the threat of consequence for engaging in unlawful behavior, right? This is the system that protects us and our property, the system by which we claim the right to live free. Are we really willing for some radical and unproven theory of forgiveness? I don't know that I am. But that's precisely what Jesus was teaching about, transforming the coercive nature of humanity by means of God's willingness to forgive and have mercy on us. It's beautiful in theory, but put to practice, trusting in God's forgiveness such that we and our entire world are transformed tough. In order to trust the forgiveness of the cross, we must completely transform our belief in what is and what isn't powerful. Willingly surrender to the empire of violence and domination in order to serve the kingdom of peace. Powerwas describes the difficulty of divesting from the powers of this world. It's, it's linked to our possessions, he says. Fearing that others desire what we have or stung by the seldom acknowledged sense that what we have we do not deserve. We see self-deceptive justifications that mire us in patterns of injustice which can be sustained only through coercion, he writes. And, of course, we believe our most precious possession to be the self that we have created, that we have chosen. Such a possession we do not lose, as we clearly see in the character of the disciples from the Gospels, simply by being willing to give up all that we have. The disciples do this to follow Christ and still have much of their self that is in need of transformation. What Jesus offers is a journey, an adventure. Once undertaken, we discover that what's we want help, what we once held valuable, even the self, we no longer count as anything. Now, Jesus' cross, however, is not merely a general symbol of the moral significance of self-sacrifice. The cross is not the confirmation of facile assumptions that it's better to give than to receive. Rather, the cross is Jesus' ultimate dispossession through which God has conquered the powers of this world. The cross is not just a symbol of God's kingdom is that kingdom come. And it's only by God's grace that we are enabled 
to accept the invitation to be a part of that kingdom. Because we have confidence that God has raised this crucified man. We believe that forgiveness and love and peace are alternatives to the coercion the world thinks necessary for existence. And thus our true nature, our true end is revealed in the story of this man whose life we believe, in whose life we believe, is to be found truth. The peace and forgiveness about which Jesus speaks to his disciples seems so beautiful and docile when viewed from afar. But when we realize that the scriptures are a means by which God seeks to lay claim on our hearts and lives, these words become deeply challenging. Through the resurrection, we see God's peace as a present reality, writes Hauerwas. Though we continue to live in a time when the world does not dwell in peace. When, when, the world, uh, when the wolf cannot dwell with the lamb and the child cannot play over the hole of the asp. We believe nonetheless that peace has been made possible by the resurrection. Through this crucified but resurrected Savior, we see that God offers to all the possibility of living in peace by the power of forgiveness. And it is crucial that we understand that such a peace is only possible if we are also a forgiven people. We must remember that our first task isn't to forgive, but to learn how to be forgiven. Too often, to be ready to forgive is a way of exerting control over another. We fear accepting forgiveness from another because such a gift makes us powerless. And we fear the loss of control involved. Yet we continue to pray, forgive us our debts. Only by learning to accept God's forgiveness as we see it in the life and death of Jesus can we acquire the power that comes from learning to give up power, from learning to give up control, learning to accept forgiveness and live as forgiven people enables us also to become whole people, able to be at peace with the sometimes unpleasant truth of who we have been. Because we know that sin can no longer destroy us nor does it define who we are to be in the new life which God gives us. Forgiveness rescues us from a life possessed by sin in which coercion and lies seem like necessary tools for survival. And it frees us. Forgiveness frees us to follow the way and the truth and the life the cross shows us precisely how losing our life to the powers of this world enables us to gain our life within the kingdom of forgiveness. Friends, Christ is risen. We are forgiven. Trust this and be transformed. Trust this and may peace be with you. Amen. Thank you.
Amen. Friends, let us respond to the word of God in song. Our response of him is number 310. Thine is the glory. Let us rise together and sing. The wind feels great. It's <laughs> horrific for these pages. <laughs> Continue in unison, affirming our faith using words from the Presbyterian Confession of 1967. Christians, what do we believe? We believe that the risen Christ is the Savior for all. Those joined to him by faith are set right with God and commissioned to serve as his reconciling community. Christ is head of this community, the church, which began with the apostles and continues through all generations. Please be seated. Oh, wait, we're going to sing first. I always do that. Let's do uh, 20 squats, some jumping jacks. As we prepare to gather at that table, which is for us a foretaste of the kingdom of God, a promise and a symbol of that which is already present here, being shared and distributed among us, nourishing the life that we live, which builds that kingdom stronger and stronger. Let us approach the table in song renewing our faith that the one who invites us is indeed the Lord. 
Let us sing together. Now you may be seated. What does it mean that this feast is a foretaste of the kingdom of God? What are we to make of the scriptures that, that tell us that all shall be gathered at this feast, at the great banquet of God, that people shall come from north and south, from east and west. Are these merely the cardinal directions we learned about in geography class? Or do they stand for the places that we come from beyond geography? Do, do they stand from the places where hearts and minds can dwell. To say that at this feast in the kingdom of God, people literally and figuratively come from all over. It is within that claim that this is a table set for all types of people from all types of places, feeling all types of feelings, believing all types of beliefs that Jesus can unite us. And indeed, Jesus is the one who invites us. This is not Amp Hill's communion. This is not a Presbyterian table to which you are being invited. It is the table of our Lord, and he bids all come. Eat, drink, be fed, know the love of God, and be transformed, sent out into the world to serve the kingdom of God. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Indeed, it's right to thank you. Not simply because giving thanks for the bread and the cup was what Jesus did when he shared this meal with his friends, but it's right to thank you, God, because you've done for us through Jesus something that he didn't even need. You've forgiven us. All of our imperfections, all of our faults and failures, our shortcomings, our doubts, all of the times when we have ascribed to the power of violence or when we have denied knowing you, finding other lords and leaders to be more satisfying in the immediate presence of whatever predicament we faced. You called us into being to, to habitate a garden you had lovingly crafted, a garden which you had perfected for us, Saying, just, just obey me, follow my instructions, and there's plenty here for you, plenty here for all with whom you share. And we fell short, and you didn't give up on us. You continued to call us back, and, and, and not like angrily call us back, like, hey, you get back here. But no, God, you lovingly called us back. 
never coercing, always loving. Because love is the foundation of the world in which you want us to live. You, you, you wrote laws that you, that you shared with us to, to remind us of this, that we are to love you, that we are to love our neighbors. You sent prophets to redirect us when we, when we strayed, misinterpreted, undervalued the guidance these laws offered. And ultimately, you sent your own son in the flesh to show us what embodied love looks like in practice. And we found him so offensive that we had him put to death. But not even that would stop you from demonstrating the power of your love for us. Before he died, he was at table with friends. And he said, you might not get this now, but do this again and again and again to remember me and to remember why all this is taking place. And so as, as we gather now before participating in this holy sacrament, we ask that you send your spirit, the one that he promised to send after he had been raised up to sit at your right hand, Send that spirit now to bless these gifts of bread and cup that they would be for us full communion in you and a reminder of your love for us and the life we have in you because of him whom you sent to save us. We give thanks for these gifts. And we give thanks, not only for these gifts of bread and cup, but for these gifts. For, for the people who are gathered at your table now, sitting side by side, coming from all over. North, south, east, and west, literally and figuratively, to be made one in this feast. We give thanks to you, O oh God, for this family, your family. Amen. So gathered with friends, Jesus took the bread and giving thanks for it, he broke it. Saying, this is my body, which is broken for you. Take and eat. All of you. And if Jesus had had foil topped cups, even being the Son of God, he would have struggled with them too. So be gracious to yourselves, friends. In the same manner, he took the cup, giving thanks. He poured it out. And he said, this cup represents a new covenant sealed in my blood. Take and drink, all of you. What does this meal bring to mind? What does it bring to heart? What do you remember and recall of our Lord's teaching to you? May that and this foretaste of the kingdom nourish you, inspire you, and empower you as you are sent from this place to that place, to make that place more like this place, if that makes sense. And may Jesus bless you as you go. Let us pray. Indeed, Holy Spirit, Holy God, Holy Jesus, our Lord, go with us from this place. 
that we might be your hands and feet, but you our head, our leader, our guide, as we seek to establish through the work of our heart, through the work of our words, through the work of our hands, to establish your will. That not ours, but yours be done. We participate in you in this meal, but may we participate in you in all of our lives. Go with us. Guide us. Continue to teach us and transform us. And may we find your companionship in the words we pray alongside you, the prayer you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. As we Go, we close with the hymn, Lift High the Cross. May we take the words of this hymn and the challenge that it places on our lives as a task for those lives to, the, to, to bear the lessons of the cross and the power of of forgiveness in the relationships with which we engage from here on out in, in the way that we um, make decisions about how to treat other people and how to treat our planet. May we lift high the cross in all that we do. I invite you to rise in body or spirit as we lift it high in song. Yes, Peter, please. Congratulations. Mm -hmm. Indeed. Indeed. Yeah. Thank you.
that knowledge that each step can sometimes be a challenge What a beautiful promise to have one at our side.